Debbie, I think it's so exciting that you're doing this. Thank you. All right, I'm here with Mindy Wiesel, who is a Washington artist. We are in her um, home and her studio in, in Washington, D.C. The date today is October 19, 2010, and Mindy has graciously agreed to answer some questions about, about her life. So, Mindy, why don't we start a little bit with your, um, your family background and tell us about your, uh, the circumstances of your, of your birth, and we'll go from there. Well, my mother and father were both um, Eastern European Jews. My mother from Hungary, my father from Romania, the Siget. And um, they both were taken to Auschwitz. My father was 19, my mother was 21. They survived the camps, and when they were liberated in Bergen-Belsen, they found each other and they got married. And I was the first child born in Bergen-Belsen, January 7th, 1947. Yeah, when, when, and you were an only child? I was an only child for six years, mm -hmm. and then my brother was born, and my mother gave birth to a stillborn after surviving Auschwitz mm -hmm. before, I think the bodies were so ravaged. I think David Grossman says it's heroic that the survivors ever had children. I find it just physically miraculous that they could mm -hmm. have children. And how, how old were you when you became aware of your parents' background? Um, that's a very interesting question because I'm currently reading journals. It turns out I started keeping journals when I was 13 years old, so I have 50 years of journals and I'm reading them for this memoir I'm working on now. And I think I probably, it's not so much that I was aware of the Holocaust as as I was slowly getting older I realized, wait a minute, some people had grandparents and everybody I knew did not have grandparents. and some people didn't have numbers on their arms and things like that. So it was kind of a, a awareness as I was getting older. And by 13, I know I knew because I record a conversation that I overheard and I said they were talking about the Holocaust. Did you feel comfortable asking your parents about it? My, I didn't even have a chance to because my father was so open about it mm -hmm. and he would talk about it. And my mother, um, this is my emphasis in life. My mother did not want to talk about the tragedies of Auschwitz. She wanted to talk about the beauty that existed before the war in her home and her mother. She worked really hard at painting a real picture of my grandmother and her sisters and her family in Europe and how they lived, and she worked very hard to recreate that in America. Do you have photos of, of your parents' families? I have one picture of my grandmother. My father has a family picture, which I actually have to get for him from this book. Um, my father's family, the story is actually quite remarkable. There were 11 children and nine survived the war. So the two youngest were killed, as were my grandparents. And then my mother's family, she was the only one of her sisters who survived. And then a couple brothers survived with her, and her parents were also killed. Now, you're, um, you said you started keeping journals when you were 13. Mm -hmm. Did you ever ask yourself wh why? Now I do. I, I mean, now I do. I think the influence, I was very, very fortunate in my life. When I was 10 years old, I um, moved to California, which was not an easy thing, because I loved life in New York. I had aunts and uncles, and there was public transportation, and I was urban, raised as an urban kid, and I could go to the library. When I was six already, I was on the subways myself. I was pretty independent. Then you go to LA, in 1959, 1960, there's no public transportation, your parents disappear, and it was a very lonely time. But I met a cousin who was 30 years old at the time. She's now 83, I'm 63. We have been friends for 50 years. And she was American. Her aunts and uncles had come over from the camps also, and she always felt for me. And she actually introduced me to Shelley, when I, my husband, when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And she kept a journal, and for my 13th birthday, she gave me a journal. And I felt like it became a place where I could write without worrying about how what I was experiencing or feeling affected anybody else around me. Um, when you're a Holocaust survivor's child, there really isn't much room for your own emotional life. You're very busy trying to make life very perfect for these people mm -hmm. who've been through so much. You've, you've written and spoken about how you, you felt the, the need to, to be everything for them. Right. And Do you, do you feel that that is uh, in some way transferred to your own children? I think 
I worked very hard with my own three daughters to have them feel that their mother was working on her own happiness. I spent my entire life trying to make my mother happy and take away some of the sadness. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that was a small impossibility. Mm -hmm. It was a big impossibility. Mm -hmm. But I, I worked very hard at always trying to do everything that she possibly she wanted me to get married at 18 because they were Orthodox and people didn't live together and I was already dating my husband for two years, I got married, you know. Whatever, anything that fit into her vision, except that she wanted me to be a dental hygienist because I had nice teeth. <laughs> and I wanted to be an artist. Um, was there, an, you've spoken about your mother as being such an, an elegant and beautiful woman who appreciated the, the finer things yes. in life and the life that they had before yes. the war was so beautiful. So did you grow up with an aesthetic sensibility? I think I did, although my mother didn't really have it, I don't think. I think she had this, you know, I think that I grew up somewhat delusional. You know, you would think listening to my mother that I grew up like Diane von Furstenberg or something. You know, the truth is they owned a a home that was, they had a home and they had servants and they owned a bakery in Budapest and near Budapest and so they were, you know, somewhat educated and, but my mother longed for her only daughter to feel as if she was royalty, you know, and you would really think so. I grew up kind of in this home where only now looking back do I see that so much of it was in her imagination mm -hmm. and in the life she wanted me to have. Mm -hmm. But she had an aesthetic, yeah, no, she always loved fresh flowers, and, but you know, my mother worked very, very hard. My mother and father um, bought a bakery, and my mother worked in the front for 12 hours a day, my father worked in the back for 14 hours a day. So I grew up with an image, I didn't know what leisure was mm -hmm. till I met this American mm -hmm. cousin who had a chaise, you know, a chaise lounge. Okay. <laughs> I'd never seen one in my life. No, and and you have um, you you first picked up a, a paintbrush or a, a drawing book as a young teenager. Well, I bought something. I, I'd like to show you the the thing that I think truly changed my life. Um, when I was twelve, I found a very old battered suitcase that my parents had brought with them on the boat from Europe, and in it were these these weathered pages from a notebook and they were Yiddish songs that my father had written and I found one drawing and I've had this drawing, I don't know if you can see this, can you see this? I can see it but I don't think the camera can see it so well it's... Um, well don't touch yeah. it because, but yeah. anyway I'll describe this okay. drawing in verbally because it really probably had the greatest influence of anything in my whole life and I say this without any drama I just think it did. I was 12 years old and I find this drawing in pencil that my father did in Bergenville's in 1946 a year before I was born of the barn in the distance and the animals and a sun coming up and I ran to my father and I said, I didn't know you knew how to draw. My father said, I didn't. And I said, well, here's this drawing. And my father said, Mindela, I don't know what came over me. I had to get the sun coming up. Well, here my father, 1946, he was um, 21. And the sun was coming up. And here's my father with the number. And I knew already at that age, you know, that he was a Holocaust survivor. And I think that's when I realized that you can, that it was something viable, that you can make a mark that can say something. And this, seeing this, some, this drawing, my father never had made a drawing before and has never made a drawing since. And this lives with me ever since I'm 12. Mm -hmm. And did you take lessons? And then, as, yeah, and then an when I was in high school, you know, you always hear stories of there was one teacher. There's always mm -hmm. one teacher, mm -hmm. and there was one teacher, uh, my art teacher at Fairfax High School, Mrs. Rose, who said, you know, you should be doing this. Mm -hmm. And I started drawing and then started taking classes and then ended up majoring in art in college and graduate work and painting. And Did you ever wonder if you had, had not become an artist how you would have expressed I everything? I might have killed myself, you? and I don't say it lightly at all because... I think that there is, 
a trauma, there's no other word, an inherited trauma at being a Holocaust survivor's child, knowing that your parents had endured this, knowing the loss that they're living with, wanting, feeling like, oh my God, your, your birth is nothing short of a miracle. How could you make every minute meaningful and important? Mm -hmm. And so there's always a little bit of a sense of, have I done enough today? Did you ever m meet with, I mean, there are a lot of support groups for no, children of survivors. No, no. And to this day, I'm not a big uh, second generation Holocaust groupie or, I'm, I'm just a very much a loner actually. I don't belong to a group of artists. I don't belong to an Orthodox group, which our family is, and I don't belong to a group of lawyers, wives, which there are. I, I'm just really very much um, a mother, a wife, an artist. How do you feel when, you, or when you're working in your studio? Well, that's also a very good question because it has changed over the years. I've been painting since 1979, so 31 years, since 1978, 32 years, I mean, really seriously painting where I you know, didn't finish my graduate work and my professor said to me in 1978, Helene Hertzburn said, um, if you make work from yourself, you'll be fine. And I became obsessed with my father's number from Auschwitz and did 30 paintings. I did 100 out of which 30 for one year. I had a studio without any heat on 8th and F Street. I felt it was so appropriate for this series that I was working on. And I would call my father in California every day and say, tell me a story. And I'd go write. I start each painting by writing what I'm thinking and feeling. So if you ask me about the experience of painting in 1979, 78, it was wanting to tell their story. Then when I finished that series, I did a series called Lily in Blue about my mother being given a cobalt blue dress when she came to America and that stayed her favorite color, and that was an explosion of color. And then, then it shifted back. I did a series called Black Gifts, where I felt like I was born into such darkness, but my life was such a gift. And when you look at the work of the Black Gifts series, there really is such a sense of color trying to come out of the darkness. So it's as if two bodies of work had clashed, and. I, I thought I was rid of the darkness, and I thought I could move on with the color, but it didn't let me, and I did a very strong painting, which I have in my own private collection, called Who's the Driver? I felt driven. Mm -hmm. And then, every year, it just became a reflection of what I was experiencing. Now, when your parents saw your work, how did they respond? Well, that, that's a great question, because my parents had not a clue what it meant to be an artist. They thought I was crazy going down to 8th and F to this building with bumps and you know in the building and and um, but my mother really had a sense that I was serious about it and I think they understood that I could do something creatively and it took a long time I don't think it was a by accident that the first serious work I did had my father's number because my father at one point said monkeys could paint or you know somebody in LA at the frame shop when I was 15, I had done a drawing and the framer called and said, somebody wants to buy your drawing and I'll, I'll never forget this. The framer said, would you be willing to sell it for $35? And I said to my father, Tati, somebody wants to buy a painting mine for 30 And my father said, what are they, foolish? Mm -hmm. You know, like, so I didn't grow up exactly with anybody understanding mm -hmm. about art. But then when my father stood next to a canvas, six foot by eight foot canvas at the Jewish Museum in New York with his number in it, it was pretty potent. And I think they, you know, I took myself very seriously from the beginning. And so it forced everyone around me. And I was very fortunate that I had a husband who really believed in me being a painter. Mm -hmm. And how, how did your, your children, your girls, and your husband, how do they respond to your work? They're the most supportive team that any artist in the world could have. And it wasn't easy, Debbie, because there were years that I really felt like maybe I needed to leave my family. You know, maybe I needed to be alone in New York and painting, and it was hard. I would literally drop my three girls five years apart. I would drop them at three different schools. I would run to the studio and paint my heart out. And 
very often, and I'm, this is real, I would lay down on the, the cold wood floor, like just to close my eyes before I have to carpool again. I, it was nothing, there was nothing romantic about my life as a painter. What was romantic is that I got to go to exhibits and it was, I could say it was work, you know, I got to go to New York and look at everything. I got to read everything. I got to see everything. So things that were my passion that for other people might be, you know, I'm going to a foreign film. For me, they were my life as a painter. So that was the romantic part. The actual living a life of a painter was not easy because I was mothering as seriously as I was painting. Now, did, did your parents, and uh, your father still living? My father still living, And did yeah. your mother live to see your success? Yes, my mm -hmm. mother did. My mother, my first successful show, I mean, really the first show that was critically reviewed to acclaim and sales and collectors and all of that, whatever you would call success, it's a funny word with me, and I don't think I'll ever feel successful enough, but it was something that she saw was being respected. Now, you, you say it's a funny word. Success yeah. is a very strange, uh, you know, what success, the Museum of Modern Art still doesn't have a painting of mine, so am I successful? You know, it depends, you know, I mean, there's never enough. <laughs> let, me ref let me rephrase the question. Have you met your goals as an artist? No, never. I don't think till you die, do you? That's a good question. Do you meet your goals? But no, my mother came to my first show at the Jewish Museum in New York, and then she came to every exhibition after, and a lot of them were named after her. The mm -hmm. exhibition she missed, which was probably the greatest exhibition I ever did, was after she died. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was dying, and her doctor, who had an aunt who was a survivor, was very kind to my mother and said, Lily, let's dance. And I told my mother I would do an exhibition called Lily, Let's Dance. And I really didn't know how I, how would I honor my mother? What, what could I, I've already done all these paintings with her color and I had, I'm the only daughter and I had gone home to deal with her clothing and I took, I, I knew right then and there, and I found a factory where I could take her dresses and have them ground down into being made into handmade paper. And I used that handmade paper out of my mother's dresses and did a series called Lily Let's Dance. And what's wonderful about the Let's Dance is my mother's initials are LD. Mm. So every border, had LD, LD, Lily Deutsch, Let's Dance, mm -hmm. Lily Deutsch, Let's Dance. And the series was called Lily, Let's mm -hmm. Dance. And one piece ended up in the Israel Museum, so that was nice. If you had to put yourself, to categorize yourself or characterize yourself, would, would you say that you were a Jewish artist, an American artist, Holocaust artist, post-Holocaust artist? I, you know, I've been asked that a lot, and I don't think, um, I think being an artist is being an artist, and I think you, being an artist means that you bring to your work what is important to you, because if your work is not about what's deep inside you, it really doesn't have any potency, it doesn't have any meaning, and what is very important to me is my Jewishness. Um, I've never seen it though as a separate thing. It's not like I was raised any other way and it was a choice and I accepted my Jewishness, I, I embraced it. It was none of that. I grew up in an ultra-Orthodox home. In fact, I've become less and less observant. My children would say I've become less and less superstitious, but um, I never saw my Jewishness as a separateness. But as far as the Holocaust is concerned, I'm not interested as an artist in expressing the horrors. I am very interested in the survival of beauty. And I try to express that with the color and the light coming through. And after 30 years of working, I started working with glass, which is the ultimate light coming through. Could you talk about your the uh, transition from working in graphics and paint to, to, to glass and how that it, came about? It was purely fortuitous. For seven months I had been kind of walking around feeling like I just needed something different from painting and I remember calling my daughter in Israel at the time and saying, I don't know what, what but something. 
and I walked in to a glass studio in downtown Silver Spring and saw this woman teaching somebody how to do fused glass. I was there the next day. I didn't have a clue what I was getting into. And, I, and I'll never forget this. There was a woman who was learning there, and she said, listen, I think you should really make a chart that this is opaque and this is transparent and this is darker and deeper. And I looked at her like, are you kidding? I'm an abstract painter. I can no sooner f follow a chart than follow a recipe anymore, you know? And so I, I still don't know what I'm doing, but the work is glorious because mm -hmm. I'm totally free and very uh, open to it. It's, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I feel like when I, my husband says, how can you say your work is beautiful? And I'll say, because once I've done it, it's somebody else's. It's not, I'm not talking about my work anymore. So I'll be the first to say, oh, I don't like it. Or, God, it's wonderful. In the same wonder that somebody else might say, how did that get done? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm a vehicle. I'm just a vehicle. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So, I'm, I don't feel very conscious working. When you're working. So on the, yeah, on the, um, the, the, the spectrum of, darkness and light and beauty and things that are not not beautiful where do you where do you put yourself in terms of your your outlook toward life I'm very optimistic I'm a great believer and you pick yourself up you figure it out you move forward I have worked very very hard at finding a self and living a life I had a nervous breakdown when I was 27 it took moving 3,000 miles away from my parents to have space where I could even have a nervous breakdown because mm -hmm. when I was mm -hmm. around them I had to be mm -hmm. perfect and make them happy and I'd watch their face all the time and I had very little feeling of how I felt. I mean, I think it's interesting. I've been working on this memoir and you know, when I was six years old, I was already taking the subways myself from my school in Borough Park to my parents' bakery in Bensonhurst and, you know, I'd get to the bakery. I was an anxious wreck on that train with the doors closed too quickly. Would I miss my stop? Would I leave my homework once I left my eyeglasses? I'd get to my parents' business, and nobody said the way I would say to my children now, so how was your day, darling? You know, how are you? They'd say, say hi to Rose, you know, mm -hmm. the sales girl mm -hmm. in the bakery, and be nice, and, you know, you can wait. Mindel understands. You know, there was like always being treated like an adult, mm -hmm. and so there was, was no childhood, mm -hmm. which Helen Epstein has written about mm -hmm. a great length in Children of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But um, it sounds like they loved you very much. I think that was the save. The saving factor is that they. I had damaged parents. There is no one who survived the mm -hmm. camps who weren't damaged. Did they love me probably fiercely beyond? If I got hurt, my mother would hit me. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't embrace me. She would really hit me because how could I let myself be hurt? Mm -hmm. I remember being 11 years old and being sent from Los Angeles to, to back to New York to visit my cousins and aunts and uncles. And it was a very, very bumpy flight. And I kept praying, oh, please, God, don't let the plane go die because my parents won't survive. Not that I'm gonna die. There was not an ounce of fear for myself. It was just like, please don't make them go through anything more. So there was that early awareness of what they had gone through. Mm -hmm. That's quite a burden for a child. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. Can we talk about your uh, your Jewishness and Jewish yeah. identity? Yeah. I know this was, a, growing up in an Orthodox mm -hmm. home, this was something you, that was every day, mm -hmm. was part of, part of every day. At, um, what what level of observance did you bring to your home when you were raising your well, children? Well, it changed also over the course of 45 years. When I got married, I married somebody who was modern Orthodox, and um, we created our own home together. Um, I became more and more and more liberal. My husband still is pretty much the same dedicated modern Orthodox, and we always kept Shabbat, and we always kept holidays, and... We always kept kosher um, and would only eat fish out or things like that. But um, I mean, when I was a child, we would tear the toilet paper before Shabbat so as not to tear, mm -hmm. you know, not to do any activity mm -hmm. at all on Shabbat. So it's quite different from. So your kids don't do that? 
<laughs> we don't want kids. Don't do it. I don't do it. <laughs> Cause, cause as, a, as, <laughs> as, as, as the child of survivors, did, did you ever have the sense that being Jewish was something you'd rather not have to deal with Never. because this was the source of all this? Not only that, but I'm, I'm so proud of, you know, it was very shocking to me to learn when my daughter, my youngest daughter, made Aliyah moved to Israel, it was really shocking to learn that most Israelis my age who are Holocaust survivors' children don't acknowledge it because when their parents came to Israel after the camps, they didn't want their children to feel that they were like lambs taken to the slaughter. They were going to be Israelis mm -hmm. and Zionists and tough, you know. We went to New York and everybody I knew was a Holocaust survivor's child and I was very proud and I'm still very proud. I think my father's my hero. Mm -hmm. He so never complains. Yeah. So it was a, a legacy that you I was that proud you accept of it. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I never knew differently and I and I the only thing I'm sorry about is that I have to be so anxious because I grew up with such a sense of the knock on the door or mm -hmm. impending doom and it it's taken years of therapy, really thirty years of therapy, of really devoted work and, and believing in living in this moment, mm -hmm. that that's all we have. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to live. And What's the really, secret? I think really learning to live in this moment that you can't change anything that you can't control. So yeah, there's a great quote in the Talmud. I love this quote. It's, at the end of one's life, one is held responsible for the permissible pleasures one has not allowed themselves. And I think, you know, you, you I, I mean, my mother and father, with everything they went through, all they wanted is I should be happy. Now, that can be a real burden because there's no room for feeling low or feeling angry or feeling upset or feeling, period. I mean, who can be happy all the time? So you don't learn to recognize mm -hmm. your emotional life. But then, you know, you have to want to be happy. And ever since I was a child, I really wanted to be happy. I think by nature, I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a great, you know, I, I have friends who call me a force for the good. To me, that's the highest compliment, mm -hmm. just the highest. Mm -hmm. Uh, can do you remember your first? I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and, and talk about Israel and your connection to Israel. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first visit? Yes, um, I got married very young. I was 18, and my husband was 19. And I knew that my mother's brother and my father had a brother and an uncle that had gone to and two brothers. And I had two uncles, a great uncle. Uh, three, I had a lot of uncles who had gone to Israel after the war. So Israel was something I grew up with hearing about in my home, but I had never gone with my parents. It wasn't like I sent my kids on youth groups and it was not, none of that. But when my husband and I got married, we actually thought we were going to go live in Israel for a year and the Vietnam War broke out and so he had to go to law school. So we never did have our year in Israel. But uh, we started going every year in 1968, and his whole family were very Zionistic, and they actually moved, now it's about 28 years ago, to Israel. Everyone, we're the only Americans here. So we used to schlep all three kids every year, and put them on the summer programs. Now, it's just not by accident that one of our daughters ended up in Israel. Mm -hmm. and, how, I, yeah. Yeah. and it sounds like you're, you're not unhappy Upset. about that. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. It took one year of waking up in the... I would wake up. This was. This is exactly how it was. For one whole year after she made Aliyah, I would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I could not wrap my brain around the fact that my University of Chicago kid was in Israel. Like, how did that happen so fast? And how did it happen? She never really taught. She had gone to Hebrew for a year in her junior semester from Chicago, but we didn't think she'd end up in Israel. And so it took a year, and now I'm thrilled because hopefully my husband and I will be spending more and more time, which has always been a dream of ours, so at least we'll have one daughter there. Mm -hmm. And that feels good. Yeah. So you feel connected to, to Israel? Yeah, and I'm proud of her. I mean, she's mm -hmm. more courage. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And you, I know you, you've traveled to um, a lot with your yes. art. Uh, and do you want to talk a little bit about your visit to Germany? 
Yes, I have traveled a lot. I've spoken in Cairo where, to a whole group of Egyptian women and who cried when I talked about the Holocaust. And I've talked to a lot of cultures. The most unusual trip was this trip, recent trip in 2009 to Germany. I had an exhibition in Berlin and the United States State Department sent me almost like a cultural ambassador kind of. I, they put together an itinerary of me speaking to Germans in Hamburg, Berlin, a burnt out bunker in Kiel near the University of Kiel, at Dachau to groups of students and to um, and ended up taking me to Bergen-Belsen where I was born. What's unusual about this trip is that a lot of the people I spoke with were Nazis, descendants, children, grandchildren. And I spoke very strongly about how we can't move forward in hate. Mm -hmm. And there was, we've, I've really developed some genuinely close friendships. Um, genuinely close, where we email, where we visit each other. I've had a woman, Dr. Beata Lindemann, who's works, um, it lives, is German, lives in Germany, and is part of the Woodrow Wilson Center here in Washington, and she visits, I mean, I, it's just part of my life. So what's, now, what's the, the lesson you take away from I that? think, I always, even as a kid, I remember, I really want to know who somebody is. When I was a visiting artist at Haifa University in 1986, I had a class full that felt like truly what Israel was. I had an Arab student. I had a British soldier in his 70s who was in the British Army in his 70s. I had an Israeli crippled soldier who painted with his mouth. I had a Shalom Achshav, Peace Now woman. I had, you know, and a young woman who was one of the best painters I ever met and I went to her kibbutz to really plead for them to give her more money for paints on their budget. and. And I, I think that experience in 1986, teaching a world in a class, really, I really understood that mm -hmm. people are people. And I try to connect on a very human level mm -hmm. to people. And it's not an accident that my daughter is such a humanitarian and at her wedding in Israel, under her chuppah, there was a Palestinian and a Jordanian and an American and an Israeli. And Quite a testament to the, the openness yeah. that, that she has. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mindy, um, just a few more questions. Do you, do you see yourself as a player in the story of the Jews? You know, in a way, our world is bigger than ever, and in a way, our world is smaller than ever. Um, I could be in Bergen-Belsen talking to my father in California, and I can be in Israel talking to my husband in Washington, and I can be connected with a dialogue and artists and writers and people all over the country with the world of technology that we live in. To see myself as a player assumes a certain um, significance. All I can hope is that my very strong belief in the survival of beauty and the necessity for beauty, meaning, what does beauty mean? It means that when my children growing up asked me if I believed in God, I said, I don't know. I, it's very hard to believe in a God after your whole family was killed in Auschwitz. But look at the flowers. So flowers could make me believe in God. So my message has always been that I don't know about, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a historian. I'm a, I, in me, I have the gift of being able to make art. The word talent, by the way, is Greek, and it means responsibility. So when I teach and students ask me, am I talented? I really will say, do you accept the responsibility of being alone in a room and feeling what you have to feel and being honest with your materials? So I, as far as that answer with a player, I hope, I would hope, and this is a wonderful opportunity, that I'm so grateful and privileged to have you interview me because as, more, as much as I can speak about the importance of moving on, proud to be Jewish, believing in staying open to other cultures and other dialogues with people who were your enemies, I think it's the only way we can move forward.
Thank you. Is there thank anything you. you would like to, to add? That no, I, I just thank you very much for this opportunity wow. to care about what I have to say. Thank you. Yeah.